Welcome to the IISS this afternoon. Uh, for the purpose of the video recording taking place, uh, my name is Rahul Roy Chaudhary. I am the Senior Fellow uh, for South Asia at the Institute. Fourteen years ago, India officially enunciated its formal nuclear doctrine in the form of a one-page press release. Taking place nearly five years after India's five nuclear weapon tests in 1998, this document focused on the no first use of nuclear weapons, massive retaliation, a credible minimum deterrent, and commitment to the goal of a nuclear weapon free world. In November last year, India's Defense Minister publicly questioned India's no first use policy, but subsequently clarified that this was only his thinking and that India's nuclear doctrine had not changed. The 2014 election manifesto of the Bharatiya Janata Party, now the ruling party, had sought a revision of India's nuclear doctrine, but nothing more has emerged from this so far. At the same time, India is enhancing its ability to launch nuclear weapons from land, sea, and air. India's high decibel nuclear diplomacy has focused on seeking membership of the nuclear suppliers group after successfully becoming a member of the missile technology control regime. How does India's leadership view questions of nuclear deterrence and strategic and crisis stability? Should India review and revise its nuclear doctrine? Should the quest for nuclear suppliers group membership be a foreign policy priority of the Indian government? To discuss these issues, I'm delighted to introduce Ambassador Rakesh Sood to speak today on India's nuclear doctrine and nuclear diplomacy. Ambassador Sood is a long-standing friend of the IISS. As the first Joint Secretary of the Division of Disarmament and International Security Affairs in India's Ministry of External Affairs, he spoke at the Institute's South Asia Security Conference in Dubai 15 years ago. As the Ambassador of India to France, he spoke in this room on Afghanistan, where he had previously served as India's Ambassador. As a Special Envoy of the Prime Minister for Disarmament and Nuclear Non-Proliferation Issues, he delivered the keynote address at the IISS Nuclear Workshop in New Delhi, utilizing his earlier experience as the Ambassador of India to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. And as a Distinguished Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi, India's leading foreign policy think tank, he speaks to us today. It's a pleasure to be back at IISS. We have had a long association, and uh, therefore I find many old friends and old faces here among the audience, and it's a pleasure, therefore, a double pleasure, therefore, to be back. What I propose to do is talk for, say, about 25 minutes or thereabouts. And then after that, uh, open the floor for questions. Rahul talked about 1998 and post-1998, the spelling out of the nuclear doctrine as a nuclear weapon state. In this, there are essentially three documents which go under the name of India's nuclear doctrine. Although we've not spelt it out as a doctrine per se, because if you actually see these documents, and they're pretty short documents, you'll find that uh, they are more in the nature of a larger policy than merely doctrine, and I'll explain that in a minute. Which are these three papers? The first one was a speech that was given by Prime Minister Vajpayee on 28th of May, 1998, when Parliament opened. The tests had been carried out on 11th and 13th of May. Parliament was convening, and on 28th, he initiated the discussion on this issue by, laying, by making a speech on the issue and by placing a paper, on, tabling a paper in the House. So that's sort of document number one, as it were. The second document, and this is very unusual for any country to have done, I dare say this is probably a unique example, was one of the draft nuclear doctrine that was circulated in 1999. You see, what we had done was we had set up a National Security Advisory Board and requested them to come up with a draft doctrine, 
and the idea behind the government's decision to actually put it out for public consumption was to generate a discussion on it and gain greater um, value out of it. So that is document number two. It was called the draft doctrine. The third was in 2003, after a meeting of the Cabinet Committee on Security, which is chaired by the Prime Minister, which is the, on security-related matters, the highest decision-making body in India. And that met in January of 2003, and that came out with a short press release. And that's about 250 words or thereabouts. It's about a page and a half. And that sets out certain elements. Now, all these three are not identical, but nor are they that dissimilar. However, to come back to the point that I made earlier, they, they also talk about India's export controls, India's um, commitment to global nuclear disarmament. It talks about India's participation in the fissile material cutoff treaty negotiations. It talks about India's moratorium on testing and so on. Now, normally you would think that these are not items which would form part of what we conventionally would understand as nuclear doctrine which would relate to, say, deployment, employment, guidance, relating to use of nuclear weapons. These, many of these aspects like nuclear disarmament, moratorium, and so on, participation in fissile material cutoff treaty negotiations, export controls would be items that would probably go beyond a narrow remit of what is called a doctrine. But then these elements, why this was a larger subject that was covered was because actually the thinking about nuclear policy predates 1998. And in a sense, if you look at it from 1974 to 98, if you look at that period, a lot of Indian speeches and Indian pronouncements related to the nuclear option. Because in 1974, India had tested a PNE, a peaceful nuclear explosion had been undertaken. And that was not weaponized for decades. And uh, therefore, but what was safeguarded, so India would often talk about safeguarding India's nuclear option. And even as India continued to take initiatives for global nuclear disarmament in multilateral fora, like the United Nations or other initiatives uh, together with like-minded countries, we would always talk about the fact that India has a nuclear option. India will not give it up unless there is an improvement in the security environment around us which will permit us to renounce this option. A term that was often coined by some of the Indian thinkers at that time was the term called recess deterrence. We've forgotten all. Most of us, I guess, would not remember those details. But So the point I'm trying to make is that there was a, a kind of a vocabulary that had grown around the fact that India had a nuclear option earlier. If you go back beyond that to 1947 and look at the period from 47 to 74, Again, you will find that there is a fair amount of commentary on nuclear policy. And this, in a sense, is what defines even the doctrine post-1998. The nuclear thinking, 1947 onwards, was guided by a certain worldview. And... Uh, it was influenced by thinking in the world overall and also by the worldview held by the Indian leadership. First and foremost, 1945 was the beginning of the nuclear age. Two things, two sentiments dominated thinking immediately thereafter. The first was the enormous destructive power of nuclear weapons. And the world was shocked with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So there was this enormous horror and there was one strong sentiment that said that these weapons are too dangerous, should never be used again, must be given up, must find ways of getting rid of it. And so that was the whole idea behind global nuclear disarmament and ending the arms race and so on. So that was one. 
The arms race, of course, didn't exist in 1945, but came up as soon as the Soviet Union detonated in 1949. The second sentiment that it generated was that this was seen as an enormously significant advance in nuclear science and technology. So much so that it was felt that for the, this time we had cracked the mysteries of matter, of universe, of creation, and so on and so on. And it was felt that this, mastering this technology, would actually have enormous long-term benefits of, for economic development and everything. And the phrase that was used in the 50s was, when nuclear power was being talked about, was that electricity too cheap to meter. Well, that was the kind of phrase that was used in the Atoms for Peace resolution uh, by the, in, in presenting the Atoms for Peace resolution. So I mean, these were the two sort of sentiments which dominated thinking around the world on this issue. In Nehru, we had a prime minister who led the country from 47 to his death in 64. In Nehru, we had a prime minister who was passionately committed to science and technology and felt that science and technology or harnessing science and technology was the best way to leapfrog India from the centuries of colonial rule. In this, he was accompanied, he had uh, Dr. Homi Bhabha, who was the first person who, to, he, he became a good, he was a personal friend of Nehru. He was a globally renowned nuclear physicist, had worked and, in London, and uh, I think at he was one of the youngest. Before 31, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society. He was an FRS. And he decided to come back to India because he was enthused by Nehru's vision of the importance of science and technology, something that he deeply shared. And so he set up the Department of Atomic Energy in 1947. I mean, so much so that if you think back on it, the first piece of legislation on atomic energy in India was passed in 1948. In 1948, just visualize the situation. You had India, which had just become independent, had been partitioned. A million people had been killed. 10 million people were refugees. India had been to war with Pakistan on Kashmir. The Constituent Assembly was meeting and drafting India's new constitution. Now, in the middle of all these kind of crises, you say, well, you know, how does the Atomic Energy Act assume this kind of priority? But that was, the, but why I highlight this is basically to point to the vision of the kind of leadership that existed in India and the importance they gave to this particular subject. So, while and guiding this for Nehru, for example, was also India's historical experiences. I mean, India had gained independence on the strength of a movement. Gandhi's nonviolence, independence struggle, was what had led India to independence. So that formed very much part of Nehru's own thinking and Nehru's experience. At the same time, India was acutely conscious of the fact that the world was going to get polarized. The seeds of Cold War were already becoming, the shoots of Cold War were already becoming visible. Uh, NATO had come into being, Warsaw Pact had come into being, the age of superpower rivalry was just beginning. And Nehru decided right at the beginning that India would not be drawn into any of these camps, that India would be, would remain outside. And that was the best way for India to ensure its strategic autonomy. India was too large a country to be drawn into either of the camps. Now, that led to the birth of the non-alignment. For Nehru, non-alignment was a policy. When it becomes a movement, obviously, then the movement in some ways tends to influence policy in return. But that's a separate subject. But the point, so therefore, if you look at it, you see the global trends in thinking about nuclear science and technology the importance of peaceful applications, the horror of the weapons, Nehru's own thinking 
on this, coupled with Baba's vision and his commitment to development of nuclear science and technology for economic development, um, Nehru's grounding in the independence movement on the lines of the principles of nonviolence, add to it the strategic autonomy aspect, and that, in a sense, brings together the elements which you will find reflected even later in post-1998 as the elements in the nuclear doctrine. And this is why, why I explain this is because I think this is what makes India a sui generis case. You know, not many people realize that India, because of all this, had a fairly advanced civilian nuclear program. In fact, the most advanced civilian nuclear program in all developing countries, in Asia, certainly. The first nuclear research reactor in India went critical in 1956. It was the first civilian research reactor in all of Asia. The first nuclear power plant, India started building it with US assistance in 1963. It started generating power in 1969. It was the first nuclear power plant in all of Asia. So what, is, what makes this different is that unlike other nuclear weapon states, where each program began as a weapon program, and the US clearly exploded, undertook the Trinity test, and subsequently the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, followed by the Soviet Union. Soviet Union exploded in 1949, and after one explosion was declared a nuclear weapon state. It was pursued as a nuclear weapon program. The same was true for Britain, which followed, for France, and for China in 1964. In fact, the same path has also been followed by other countries subsequently, whether it is Israel or whether it is North Korea. So from that point of view, India remains unique in a sense that it is the only country which actually had an advanced civilian nuclear energy program for decades before it chose to go down the other route for reasons of safeguarding its national security. The second thing, which also makes India somewhat unique, is that it is an enormously reluctant nuclear weapon state, which ties into what I just said, because after demonstrating its capability in 1974, it waited for nearly a quarter century before actually undertaking the next series of tests and declaring itself a nuclear weapon state. That's one of the reasons why the military came into the nuclear loop much later. See, in many of the other countries where it is pursued as a military program right from the outset, as a weapons program, the military will obviously come into the loop much earlier. But in India's case, it remained directed strongly by a political leadership and by a small civilian leadership. And therefore, once from 74 to 98, there were a whole series of developments that took place, which ultimately led to India taking this particular decision. The third element, which renders India's case sui generis, is that India perhaps, despite not being a member of the NPT, despite not being a member of the nuclear suppliers group, although after 2008 India declared that it would adhere to the principles and guidance and decisions of the nuclear suppliers group, India probably has a cleaner non-proliferation record than many other countries that have been members of these groups or parties to this treaty. Now, the elements of the doctrine, I think those, for most of you, you would be familiar very simply, and I, I also mentioned the three documents, and for any of you who are interested, you can find them on the internet quite easily. The elements of India's nuclear doctrine, which are common in basically all the three documents, one is maintaining a credible minimum deterrent, a no first use policy, non-use policy against non-nuclear weapon states, not engaging in an arms race, 
the sole purpose of nuclear weapons being to deter nuclear blackmail and nuclear aggression against India, which is sole purpose, which is, I mean, the purpose is not full spectrum deterrence or the purpose is not to prevent any kind of conflict in India or anything like that. The sole purpose of India's nuclear arsenal is to prevent nuclear blackmail and nuclear aggression against India. The civilian command and control, which is reflected in the structure of the nuclear command authority with its political council and its executive council, and the, even this is accompanied with a reiteration of the commitment to the idea of global nuclear disarmament under verification, universal global nuclear disarmament under international verification. Now, now that some of these, uh, now that India is gradually weaponizing its deterrent in terms of building up its capabilities to have a triad, which is what had been declared as the objective in 1998, the military is obviously closely involved in the processes. And therefore, it is quite natural that we see the beginnings of the debate that Rahul uh, referred to. For example, in the run-up to the elections in 2014 was the discussion as to about whether or not India should have another look at its nuclear doctrine. The questions have been raised about no first use. Questions have been raised about what is minimum deterrent? How do you define it? Questions have been raised about uh, massive retaliation. Is it credible? I mean, this is, in a sense, I would say quite understandable because the political leadership in India has understood the nuclear weapons to be somewhat different than, let's say, conventional weapons. I mean, the best way to put it is, as Bernard Brody put it, uh, when he said that so far uh, wars have been fought. Wars have been fought because people want to win the wars. And now, the sole objective will be to prevent wars. And that, so, you know, the changed definition of the role of a nuclear weapon comes out very clearly in that. And I think that, uh, therefore, the Indian political leadership has always seen India's nuclear weapons as political, as weapons that are political in character, not as weapons of war fighting. And I think this thinking has, is something that has led to the conceptualization of India's nuclear doctrine, but a nuclear doctrine that is very solidly rooted in India's own experience and the vision of its political leadership, and therefore actually shows a degree of consistency. I mean, when people talk about changing no first use and moving to first use, it is not just a question of deleting one word. It comes with a whole range of other paraphernalia associated with it. What is the kind of arsenal that you would have if you were to engage in first use? What is the kind of command and control that you would have? And what would be the delegation levels if you were to engage in first use? So the point I'm making is that here, and then, obviously, if you're looking at first use, then what are the kind of threats that you would hope you would need to deter by positing first use? So it takes you away from sole purpose. It takes you away from a whole host of other things. And which is why we have not gone down that particular road, because going down that road would also make it uh, inconsistent with the kind of uh, historical experience that I pointed out. Having said that, I would also add that I, I don't think that any nuclear doctrine is going to be written in, you know, uh, engraved in stone. Ultimately, sooner or later, and I think there should be a regular periodicity. As I mentioned, 2003 was the last time uh, a formal document came out talking about the India's nuclear doctrine. I think. As a responsible nuclear weapon state, perhaps once in a decade or something like that, 
we should undertake a review of our nuclear doctrine, taking into account the scientific and technological developments that have taken place, let's say, over a period of time, taking into account the developments that have taken place in our neighborhood in terms of our changing threat perceptions and so on, and update our doctrine accordingly. However, I think that as of today, I would be fairly confident in saying that perhaps these elements that were identified remain robust and intact. Let me add a word on the nuclear suppliers group before I close. Last year, there was a lot of controversy about the fact that India's application to join the nuclear suppliers group did not get the support that it merited in Seoul, and it was blocked uh, by China and some other countries. I think perhaps uh, the fact that India, the points that I made about India being a sui generis case, that India being a responsible nuclear weapon states were already well recognized in the exceptional waiver that the nuclear suppliers group had given to India in 2008. Now, thereafter, and it is thereafter that India had said that it would pursue membership in all the four ad hoc export control regimes, the nuclear suppliers group, the missile technology control regime, the Australia group, and the Vasanar arrangement. The missile technology control regime membership uh, was completed last year. India is working on both the Australia group and the Vasanar arrangement uh, details. And the nuclear suppliers group, after the exceptional waiver, was a logical next step. However, for, re for reasons which are uh, entirely non-nuclear in my view, shall I say, for purely political reasons, China took it, it's a different China today in 2016 as the China in 2008. And therefore, China took a different decision. I have a feeling that it will eventually happen, but this is obviously something which, is, which will require India and China to overcome the hurdle which this has created in their relationship. We will find we have a multidimensional relationship with China. We'll find other ways to get around this obstacle, I'm sure, in sooner rather than later. Having said that, let me, I think I have spoken for 25 minutes as I was asked to do. So I'll stop here and I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Ambassador Sooth. Uh, you've pointed out very clearly the historical experiences that uh, India has taken into account in formulating uh, its nuclear doctrine and the three uh, key documents uh, which need to be seen as part of o India's overall uh, nuclear uh, policy. Uh, let me uh, begin the discussion session uh, by asking you uh, a question related uh, to, to two, two uh, issues, I think. Uh, the first is uh, when you mentioned that uh, the sole purpose of India's mm -hmm. nuclear weapons uh, is to prevent nuclear blackmail and nuclear aggression against India. Uh, the 2003 uh, document actually, you know, uh, talks about uh, the, uh, the India's use of nuclear weapons uh, yeah, yeah, uh, in terms of uh, uh, an attack on Indian territory or on Indian forces anywhere. I mean, is there a sense of sort of a contradiction between these two issues or not? And the second issue is when you suggest that as a responsible nuclear weapons uh, state, India should uh, have a periodic review of its uh, doctrine. Uh, could you uh, sort of give us a, a sense of what uh, the two or three key uh, shifts or changes uh, could be if such a review uh, was carried out. Thank you. you yeah, please, end of it. Well, the first part, as I mentioned, you know, there are, I referred to three documents, and I said that while there are lots of similarities in the three documents, there are um, some areas of difference. Now, if you look at the 1998 speech and the 1999 uh, draft, you will not have this particular caveat that would refer to. Mm -hmm. It would just say an, a nuclear attack, and a nuclear attack on India. India will know first use that India would respond to a nuclear attack on India. 
in 2003, this is, you know, uh, what has been added is India will respond to a nuclear attack on Indian territory or on Indian forces anywhere, which, I mean, which would imply that India would therefore, but this still does not imply that India would be engaging in nuclear war fighting. Mm -hmm. So it still remains the sole purpose. The sole purpose would still remain to deter nuclear threat or nuclear aggression. Mm -hmm. Whether it is on India or Indian forces are very much part of, I mean, they fly the flag of India. So in that sense, and Indian forces are not going to go and fight wars uh, thousands of miles mm -hmm. away. I mean, we have not, we don't have that kind of tradition. Mm -hmm. In terms, of the and in terms of the review, well, I would not prejudge a review. As I said, I more or less hinted that, let's say, if we were to undertake a review today, I think that I think that the, both the credible minimum deterrent um, and no first use and sole purpose would remain intact and ought to remain intact for the very simple reason that we are still on our way to achieving the triad which is going to constitute the mainstay of India's nuclear deterrent. And we have aircraft. Our land-based missile capability is still being developed. Uh, we have deployed missiles of intermediate range capability somewhere around 3,000, 3,500 kilometers. India is still testing, but has not yet gone into any production or decision regarding the deployment of longer range missiles which have been tested. Uh, India's nuclear submarine uh, is still undergoing its first tests, and this is the first one, and after this there are plans to start building the second one. The submarine launched nuclear uh, SLBMs, the submarine launched ballistic missiles, is also something which needs to be developed because what we have as an SLBM is a relatively shorter range missile of about 700 kilometer range or something like that. So it doesn't make sense to have an SLBM on an SSBN with a range of 700 kilometers. You would need a missile which would have a range of say four or 5,000 kilometers for your SSBN to actually form a dependable element of the triad. So I think that once we are in a position where the triad gets operationalized, then I think that would be an appropriate time perhaps to take a look at elements of the doctrine. But taking a look at elements of the doctrine doesn't mean that you necessarily have to change. I mean, that would be prejudging. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I think the change will come, let's, it depends on a whole host of other technological developments. What happens to missile defense? What happens to other elements? What happens to the world around us? I think there is a huge element of unpredictability. Uh, in today's age. Mm -hmm. And the very role of nuclear weapons that people are now mm -hmm. having are relooking. So sure. I mm -hmm. would not prejudge that. Sure. Uh, I have several people on my list. Let me turn to uh, Jeremy Stoker, uh, who is the author of uh, uh, excellent Adelphi, double IWS Adelphi book on nuclear weapons. Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for a, a, a fascinating um, context-setting speech on your country's uh, nuclear doctrine. Um, can I probe you a bit further on one specific aspect of India's um, nuclear posture? Um, can you say something about um, India's attitude towards maintaining elements of its nuclear deterrent at high redness under normal conditions of peace? Well... Um, India does not India does not believe in maintaining its uh, uh, nuclear deterrent on high alert. In fact, we maintain our nuclear deterrent in a demated condition because we believe since we do not have a first use policy, so it gels in perfectly the deployment in demated condition gels in perfectly with the no first use policy, and that this is something which we believe adds to uh, nuclear stability. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mehmood Ali, if you could identify yourself. And, yeah. um, thank you, Ambassador, for sharing your insights. Uh, I was just wondering whether, given the fact that Prime Minister Bajpayee wrote to President Clinton in 1998, articulating uh, the drivers behind India's nuclear program, that. 
uh, perceived threats from China and Pakistan were actually the key drivers. What circumstances would you visualize in which um, the National Command Authority would authorize release of nuclear weapons uh, with regard to either Pakistan or China? Are there any realistic circumstances <coughs> that you think uh, under which India would authorize nuclear release against either or both of these countries? And who is the National Command Authority? Is that the Prime Minister? Does he have a veto on the, or, or, or is it a truly uh, collective, collegial body of our processes? Thank you. Well, first, the National Command Authority is led by the Prime Minister and has uh, four key cabinet ministers and the National Security Advisor. The national, it is, it can call upon and will have as invitees other service chiefs or any other, let's say the head of the DRDO or the head of the Atomic Energy if they want, need to, but they're not members. They would be called upon to provide advice as the need be. The National Command, the this is the political council of the National Command Authority. The political council would take a decision which would be implemented by the executive council, which would be like an ex-con or something like that, which would be headed by the National Security Advisor and would have the service chiefs, the head of the Strategic Force Command, we've established a Strategic Force Command, uh, and all the nuclear deployments are dealt with by the Strategic Force Command. So the head of the three services, the head of the Strategic Force Command, and any other invited members would be part of the ExCon, which would then be tasked with implementation of the decisions taken by the political council of the Nuclear Command Authority. Regarding the circumstances when such a decision would be taken, as it currently stands, the circumstance is very straightforward when India is attacked by nuclear weapons. Uh, could I just uh, add to this question, mm. Ambassador, uh, the role of the Executive Council then, I mean, which uh, is chaired by the NSA, mm. I presume. I mean, so what is the sort of interaction between the, if the NSA is uh, an invitee to the political Correct. council, so the, so the relationship between the Executive Council and the political council? Well, it, it, the NSA provides that link, in a sense that the he is sitting in the, I mean, the service chiefs could also be sitting there as invitees, mm. but he's mm. formally sitting there as specified in the composition of the political council that he will be present he because he acts as a kind of a secretary to the, to the uh, political council mm. and then takes on the role of heading mm. the executive council in mm. order to implement the decisions taken by the political council. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ijaz Hussain, uh, Double I Double consulting member. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure listening to you, and uh, I must uh, underscore my aplomb, uh, saying that uh, there is always something new when you say something on this issue. My question is very brief. Uh, how relevant is the nuclear doctrine in an age of uh, strategic uncertainty? Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, um, I'm working on a project on something like this, and Desmond uh, sitting behind you is part of it. Um, I mean, this is a much bigger question because uh, and I think it, it raises, it brings up the old fundamental question that has existed from the beginning of the nuclear age. For those of us who have spent many years studying these matters, I mean, it reminds me, it reminds me of the debate that took place between Bernard Brody on one side and Albert Vollstetter on the other side. And Brody's view of minimum deterrence and Albert Vollstetter's view of the delicate balance of terror, you know, as he articulated it. You find this, largely it is, um, I think in Britain, uh, you had uh, PMS Blackett, Sir PMS Blackett as one of your leading nuclear scientists, who, again, like Brody, was a physicist. And I find it's interesting that uh, physicists or scientists tend to go more with the minimum deterrence kind of an approach, right from 
45 onwards, as it were. I think Brody wrote his book way back in the late 40s. Whereas Wallstetter came from a different background of pure maths. And so in the US, when people started looking at refining their doctrine and dealing with bipolarity and so on, and the modeling started getting dominated by those who had come from other disciplines like maths and um, economics. Uh, Schelling is a case in point, and he got the Nobel for economics, yet most of us know him as uh, for his writings on nuclear strategy. You know, they took a very different view on modeling, and they had much greater faith in modeling, as it were, as compared to somebody like Brody or Blackett or others, who had a different notion of deterrence. Now, I mean, as somebody said, I think it was Ken Waltz who said that all models are wrong, except that um, some are more useful for a certain period of time than others. <laughs> I mean, both statements are equally valid, <laughs> but I think <laughs> even all economists will probably agree that the first statement is also true, that all models are wrong, because there is no universal model which can last that long. So the world, generally, the US nuclear posture got dominated more by the Wallstetter group or the Wallstetter followers. And so you saw what happened with the, um, the rising number of weapons and all the rest of it, the nuclear arms race, the flexible response, the counter value, the counter force, the prevalence, and so on and so on. Well, fortunately, the nuclear taboo has been held. Whether it was because of the success of the Wallstetter model or not, I don't know. But in today's nuclear age, where a, the geopolitical center of gravity has shifted from Euro-Atlantic to Asia-Pacific, Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, where the multiplicity of players is greater, you have many more players, the bipolar equation is no longer the dominant narrative of the nuclear age, where there is both doctrinal and arsenal asymmetries because between US and USSR, they followed, they had virtually similar sized arsenals each, had about 35,000 weapons each. I mean, it didn't, uh, and they all had ICBMs and SLBMs and so on. So even their arms control only gave them, as you know full well, equal limits mm -hmm. and so on. So while, whereas here you, have a doctrinal asymmetry, you have an arsenal asymmetry, you have a technological asymmetry. You're right. So therefore, what kind of a model will lead to a stable deterrence in the second nuclear age is a subject which is, I think, on which we have to still do a hell of a lot of work. And on which a book is coming out. <laughs> well, Edited. Thank you for plugging it. <laughs> uh, Desert Boy, Double I Double Consulting Member. Uh, Desert, the, the mic. Thanks very much. Um, I, I just like Rakesh to first of all to say thanks very much for that that contextual you know, understanding of, of deterrence for, for India, which I think is very important. Um, but one of the things that um, is implied by a doctrine of no first use, and um, you reconfirmed it, is that if nuclear use, a nuclear strike is made against India or Indian forces, then the logic takes you to a, in, an Indian nuclear response. Um, and that clearly is part of deterrence that that's what nuclear opponents need to understand. But at the same time, um, I'm sort of conscious that one of the sort of themes of um, your forebears thinking about nuclear issues in the 40s and 50s was the horror, the horror of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Yeah. And 
a sort of sense that this you know, vast loss of life is something that is to be avoided and, and should never happen again. Um, and, and it's in that context, I just wonder whether you could say something about a kind of civil society and the man and woman in the street and not their necessarily their involvement, but you know, what thinking is. I mean, certainly in this country, um, you know, you talk about India being a kind of re reluctant nuclear power. I think the same can be said of the UK. I mean, each time we come to a moment where we have to renew or continue deterrence, there's a debate and discussion and uncertainty uh, until there is again a decision. And I just wonder whether you could say something about the kind of the civil context and whether it's shifting, whether there's kind of more involved on this. Thank you. Well, um, there is a group um, that was opposed to the decision of 1998. And this group of people uh, felt that India should not go down this route for a variety of reasons. I mean, some in this group would argue that it does not help India's security, addressing India's security concerns, that nuclear weapons don't make India more secure. Some would argue that this is morally incorrect on the grounds of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and all the rest of it. Some would argue on ideological grounds and so on. This group does exist. It is not that it does not. Uh, but at the same time, it is not, uh, let me put it to you like this. If you were to undertake a, a vote in the parliament today, I would, I would probably think that the vote would be pretty strongly in favor of maintaining the deterrent. And um, so I think that that was addressed reasonably well by different political leaders in 1998, in the run up to 1998 and subsequently. I must add one thing, that actually the, uh, you know, the transformation of moving from one to the other state was not that easy a decision, and it took a hell of a long time, and you would think that this is a perfect example of Indian dithering. <coughs> In 1962, India and China went to war where India was defeated. In 1964, Um, China tested and became a nuclear weapon state. The reason why India and China went to war, the boundary dispute between India and China, is still remains a boundary dispute. It has not yet been resolved. Yes, the boundary has been, the area has been peaceful. And there has been no shooting there. Nobody has been killed there for the last 30 years. But the dispute remains. Okay? Um, that is why in 1965, India was among the co-sponsors of the resolution that asked for negotiations on a non-proliferation treaty. But the idea that we had about a non-proliferation treaty was a different one of a three-legged stool, one disarmament, one non-proliferation, and one peaceful uh, cooperation, co co international cooperation for peaceful purposes. As it turned out, we found that one of the legs was slightly wobbly, and so we ended up staying outside the NPT. Not many people know that in the 65, 66, 67, in the final, as we saw the NPT negotiations taking the routes that they did, India actually tried to seek nuclear security assurances from UK, from US, and from Moscow. We were rebuffed. We were told that you are not a military ally, we can't. And that's led to the decision to steer clear of the NPT and to 74 to have the option. You come to the decade of the 80s when the world was engaged in uh, the conflict in Afghanistan, where we saw the proliferation that was taking place in the neighborhood between China and Pakistan. But because there was this big superpower struggle taking place um, it was, the proliferation was ignored. 
We saw what happened in the 90s. The indefinite and unconditional extension of the NPT had a bearing on India's decision. We always felt that Article 6 of the NPT, which talks of nuclear disarmament, is not the article which is going to lead to global nuclear disarmament. We knew that. But once the NPT was extended indefinitely and unconditionally in 1995, it was perpetuation of this which told us that as far as the NPT was concerned, this was an instrument which had come to the limits of its success. The 1996 negotiation of the CTBT was a second factor that contributed to India's decision because we were part active participants in the discussions, but when the definition of what constitutes a test that was going to be prohibited was put out, there's a zero yield definition. We realized, as Secretary of State, then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright famously said in testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, that the CTBT is in US's interest because it is intended to freeze other countries on the learning curve, because the US had obviously undertaken the largest number of tests at that point in time. And so therefore, it was quite clear to us that the CT, joining the CTBT would freeze us on the learning curve and would render our nuclear option null and void over a period of time. So once that was done, it became, for somebody like me who has been working on these issues for years and years, it was abundantly clear to me post-1995 that sooner rather than later India would test. And that is what happens. And it is this that makes India a reluctant nuclear weapon state. Uh, we've got uh, four more people on the uh, list, so we're going to move right. ahead rapidly. Uh, Antoine Levesque, uh, IISS. Ambassador Sud, uh, welcome back to the Institute. Um, I thank you very much for those very extensive um, comments, very stimulating. Um, I take this um, to be um, um, a, a narrative about change and continuity in many ways. And um, there are two recent elements of change which I would like to, um, um, to put to you. Um, last January, Pakistan tested uh, for the first time a submarine-launched ballistic missile. Um, and I wanted to ask you what uh, your thoughts may be about this in relation to regional um, stability and deterrent stability. Second, um, uh, in 2015, uh, China and Pakistan entered into uh, a so-called China-Pakistan uh, Economic Corridor um, uh, uh, multi-year project. I wondered if this had any impact on India's thinking in terms of uh, nuclear deterrence. Thank you. You want to take the other? Uh, let me take uh, one more and then a uh, okay. batch of two. Uh, Dr. Kate Sullivan, Oxford University. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your historically rich talk. And my question links in neatly with Antoine's, actually. Um, one of the things that impresses me uh, is India and Pakistan's cooperation, actually, on minimizing nuclear risk and threat. So the exchange of their um, nuclear installations lists and um, advising one another of nuclear tests, and, uh, sorry, mu missile tests, and so on. Um, but, you know, uh, relating to the point that Antoine's just made about Pakistan's uh, submarine-launched ballistic missile, and the fact that Pakistan may respond to um, the, opera the operationalization of India's nuclear submarine. Um, what does this mean for uh, the maritime uh, sort of threat or risk now? Because um, really, if, if we're not sure whether vessels um, have nuclear missiles on them, as probably will be the option that Pakistan uh, takes since it can't afford to construct its own nuclear submarine, does this blur the lines between con conventional and nuclear platforms? Um, and may, might it destabilize the nuclear relationship between the two countries? Hmm. Well, I think what is more worrisome to me is the doctrinal asymmetry between India and Pakistan. I mean, as I mentioned to you, India believes India attributes sole purpose. It doesn't surprise me that Pakistan has developed tactical nuclear weapons or anything like that, because Pakistan explains its nuclear policy as geared towards full spectrum deterrence. Now, which means that in contrast to India, 
which puts sole purpose as its element of its nuclear policy. Pakistan wants to wants its nuclear weapons to play multiple roles in ensuring its security. And so it has different roles that it attributes to its nuclear arsenal. And uh, therefore, there is a certain doctrinal asymmetry here. Now, so for me to complain about Pakistan developing this weapon system or that weapon system is irrelevant. I mean, I think we need to understand that because Pakistan has a different doctrinal approach to nuclear weapons, it will have a different arsenal. The only way out, in my view, therefore, is to revive the kind of talks that we began in 1999 under the Lahore MOU, which were able to elaborate over a period of time certain nuclear risk reduction measures in order to bring about greater stability into the region. Now, I mean, you know, um, I'm not saying that Prime Minister Modi has tried or Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif has not, has rejected his overtures or Prime Minister Modi should try more or whatever. But I do think that we need to be able to develop some kind of communication. That, to me, is uh, critical, and I have written about it. I mean, it's not enough to just drop in on a surprise visit to wish uh, the other leader happy birthday. If we can't have a more uh, sustained, substantial dialogue on limited, modest objectives, I mean, here we are not talking of resolving long standing differences on Kashmir or something like that. I think, but limited, modest objectives that contribute to nuclear stability become, I think, uh, important. And that requires a certain level of dialogue, not necessarily the same kind of high visibility political dialogue, a more mundane kind of a dialogue, which is necessary. Um, regarding the China-Pakistan economic corridor, I think this is the first time that uh, China is going to emerge as a major investor in Pakistan. I mean, China has been a strategic friend, you know, like lips and teeth, deeper than the oceans, higher than the mountains, stronger than steel, et cetera, et cetera, are various ways in which the relationship has been described uh, in China-Pakistan joint statements. But um, China has had two primary concerns with Pakistan, and both concerns were addressed by the military. One concern was, the first concern was in terms of locking in India, as it were, containing India. And therefore, the Chinese cooperation, nuclear cooperation with Pakistan, missile cooperation with Pakistan, conventional defense cooperation in terms of aircraft, tanks, etc., etc., was all geared toward that. The second concern that China had was the Uyghur separatist movement in its southwest. And once again, in order to tackle that, it was the ISI and the Pakistan military, which was relevant in terms of making sure that they kept a watch and cooperated. Now, with this $46 billion or $54 billion or whatever is the sum that the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor talks about, with this kind of an investment which involves building highways, transmission lines, power generation plants, ports, running these projects, China will obviously have to move into a qualitatively different relationship with Pakistan. And there is already a lot of writing in Pakistan about the fact that this $46 billion involves that in three decades, Pakistan will have to pay back $90 billion because some of the terms and conditions are not very clear and so on. So how this pr progresses, whether it progresses positively or negatively, whatever happens, is actually going to be a huge game changer for China-Pakistan relationship. I frankly don't know whether it will go through or not on it or in what context, because there are too many uncertainties at the moment surrounding it from the financial as well as the security point of view. Uh, it's interesting uh, you mentioned, Ambassador, the Lahore MOU. Uh, if I recollect correctly, uh, you were India's chief negotiator <laughs> for the <laughs> Lahore not, MOU. Yes, I was, but that's not why I mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, uh, the last two uh, questions, Tim. Tim. Uh, 
Tim Wills at King's College London. Um, thank you, Ambassador. That was a that was a marvelous uh, a marvelous talk. I wanted to ask you. I mean, the the tradition that you talk about, um, the you know, which has led India to be a reluctant nuclear weapon state, the tradition of nonviolence of Mahatma Gandhi running through, you know, from the 1930s right through to sort of 2014, really, um, pacifism um, uh, and, and so forth, non-alignment is actually very much a Congress party tradition. And actually a tradition which is sort of slightly under criticism now from BJP and BJP historians and so forth. Do you think, therefore, that a prolonged period of BJP uh, in government, which now looks actually increasingly likely after the UP elections, do you think might lead to a change in nuclear doctrine? Thank, and the last question, the gentleman there, yes, if you could identify yourself, please. Hi, my name is Phil Chafee with Nuclear Intelligence Weekly. Uh, two questions on the NSG. Um, the first is China has proposed a criteria-based approach to new membership in the NSG. Is that something you think India is entirely opposed to, or is it specific criteria, such as signing the CTBT, that uh, India opposes? And secondly, I'm just curious if you think the change in administration in Washington will impact the chances of Indian membership in the NFs, MBT, NSG in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Well, um, you're right that the tradition of nonviolence, Gandhi's independence movement, and so on, um, Nehru's vision, this is all Congress. But then, you know, Congress was in the lead. It led the independence movement, and Congress was the party that ruled India uh, for decades after independence. However, I think that uh, when the decision to go nuclear was taken, it was 1998 when Vajpayee, it was a BJP-led government. And Vajpayee did not move away when the 1998, the white paper that was placed, that was tabled in the House, or Vajpayee's own speech, did not dramatically move away. Yes, there was a departure in the sense of declaring India to be a nuclear weapon state. And I think in my, one of my earlier answers, I sort of gave the provocations or the developments that determined thinking since I was involved, at least during the decade of the 1990s onwards, actively involved with uh, some of the analysis and some of the thinking that was taking place. So therefore, I do know that some of these factors played a role in India, India's political leadership, shaping India's political leadership's thinking. And in that sense, there is a continuity. And so far, that continuity has been maintained. I'm not so sure whether uh, that continuity would be that easy to break. I mean, it is like breaking with your civilizational past. And uh, that is much more difficult. I, I think the, in the run-up to this election, the 2014 election, there was talk of questioning of no first use. And Prime Minister Modi very quickly put an end to it by giving two press interviews where he reiterated that no first use was not going to be tampered with. And uh, so therefore, I don't think that it is going to be tampered with that easily. However, as I mentioned, I think from time to time, we need to undertake a review. And there will be developments that are taking place. Because let's not forget, I mean, this is a 70-year-old technology we are talking about. There are a whole range of new technologies that are taking, that are developing in you know, the cyber-related stuff that is happening, outer space, space dependence, asymmetric warfare, hybrid warfare, all kinds of stuff that is taking place, which could force us to relook at the role of nuclear weapons. So I'm not foreclosing my mind that there will never be a change. But I don't think that it will be a change for the reason that BJP wants to put its stamp and therefore wants to make a break. I think that is not the driving motive. Uh, on the NSG, well, about the impact of the US administration, and the change in the US administration, I'm afraid I'm pretty unclear about the policies on this matter of the new U.S. administration, like on many other issues, so I will not comment on that. But as far as the criteria-based approach is concerned, I think that is completely an eyewash. I mean, 
you know, to have a criteria-based approach for countries that are not parties to the NPT. I mean, which are the countries that are not parties to the NPT? India, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel. I, mean, I don't think uh, we're going to have a criteria that is going to apply these, con these four countries which are as diverse as can be, and many of whom have absolutely no desire of joining the NSG or any such thing. So that's a complete waste of time in my view. And uh, I mean, good luck to any committee that gets set up to you know, elaborating a criteria-based approach which is going to apply to these four countries. It will never see the light of day. Excellent. Thank you. On that note, uh, we must end. Uh, we've exceeded our time. But uh, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to Ambassador Sooth for uh, taking time to come here and speak to us. Uh, so candidly, and uh, we look forward to continuing our long-standing friendship uh, uh, with, uh, with, with Ambassador Sood. So I'd like all of you to join me in thanking uh, Ambassador Sood for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.